Father All of heaven rose your name Sing louder Let this place erupt with praise Can you hear it? The sound of heaven touching earth Our Father, all of heaven rolls your name, sing louder, let this place erupt with praise, can you hear it, the sound of heaven touching you.
everyone. We've reached the sixth Sunday of Lent. We are in the home stretch with our uh, Lenten work this year. And that means that as a community, we at the river are transitioning to the third of our three Lenten fasts for these last two weeks of Lent. And this last fast, we are going to focus on the power of our words and how often it is that occasionally with intention, but often without intention, our words get ahead of us and go out with power that harms others, or at least is unhelpful to the building of solid, safe, affirming uh, relationships that we desire. There are so many different ways that our words um, can fall into a difficult place. So we might be prone to harsh words. We might be prone to gossip. We might be prone to what might feel rather benign of lighthearted words, but sometimes lighthearted words don't honor the moment. Maybe we run towards sarcasm or coarse language or just uh, are quite attracted to having the last word often in conversation. Each of these is worth examining whether they are the fruit of a life that is fueled by the spirit of Jesus, who is always uh, coming with love, even when Jesus comes with correction. Now, Recognizing that it's not quite as simple to just flip an on-off switch on our words, which is partly why we need to attend to them, why there's so much power in them, because they can fly so quickly. Um, For this fast, we're going to employ mostly an indirect mode of paying attention to the power of our words. And to do that, we're going to invite you to a fast from words and into a practice of silence. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, well-known Christian author and also uh, martyr, said this uh, to his Christian community about their practice. He says, we are silent at the beginning of the day because God should have the first word. And we are silent before going to sleep because the last word also belongs to God. Patterning off of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's wisdom, our encouragement would be for each of us to consider a twice daily fast from words, once at the beginning of the day and once at day's end. You'll know um, what is a good stretch in terms of the amount of time that you keep silent. It could be as simple as three minutes. You could stretch it toward 10. Um, But the conscious engaging of silence in the hope that we would partner with God to tame our words in the ways that they can go awry is our invitation for this last stretch of Lent. We'll um, continue also to release our daily uh, devotion Uh, opportunities. So if you've fallen out of practice or hadn't yet picked those up, we encourage you uh, to consider those as well and to um, look for God to meet you in the, um, I keep saying it, but in this final stretch of our Lenten journey. Uh, Before we move ahead in this stream, I do also want to let you know about the three key events for Holy Week, week after this next one. We are going to be hosting a Monday, Thursday, that's Thursday of Holy Week, watch night service from 7 p.m. until midnight. That's a long stretch, but Thursday is the day that we remember Jesus' struggle in the garden to um, take the cup that God the Father has asked of him and to be faithful all the way to the end of his death on the cross. And when Jesus wrestled in the garden, he asked his closest friends and followers to stay close and to watch and pray. So we will gather at the river uh, for those five hours on Thursday night for uh, worship 
and guided prayer. You could join us for one of those hours. You could join us for all of those hours as we give ourselves to Jesus and to Jesus' suffering. We encounter the darkness so that we can really appreciate the brightness of Easter morning. Similarly, on Good Friday in the evening at 7 o'clock, we'll have another worship gathering. We'd love for you to join us then. And then on Sunday morning, uh, we will finally get to Easter's victory. And we'll have our regular 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship services in person at uh, the Rivers Building. We hope that you might come out and join us in person. We would love to see you. So blessings on you in this last bit of Lent. Hi, it's my delight to introduce our speaker for today. His name's Chris Smiley. He's our Associate Director of Compassion Ministries. He works for our staff part-time and has at least two other jobs. Uh, it's my earnest prayer in these days that God would bring into our community young leaders who have the character and the gifts and the passion to lead God's people into the next generation. And I wholeheartedly believe that Chris is an answer to that prayer. The text for today uh, has a promise from Jesus to all his followers that there is a joy that is sturdy enough to withstand all the troubles that come our way. And I think Chris has a word regarding that text. So with that, I pray that you would open your heart to him and receive God's good gift to you. Hello, my name is Chris Smiley. Um, I've been coming to the river since 2018. In addition to being uh, part-time on staff, I'm also involved with the mission organization called World Horizons and a Christian study center called New College Berkeley. A um, couple of things about me uh, that might give you a glimpse into who I am. I like boxing. Um, as a hobby, I like to write poems and songs. As a life philosophy, I believe in making choices that lead to more tapas. Uh, what else can I share? I have three siblings, all younger, younger than me. Um, one of them actually just recently made me an uncle. Um, uh, yeah, Reuben Matthew Smiley McDonald was born just this last month of March. Super stoked uh, to hopefully see the little guy later this month of April. Um, and uh, I'm excited to be here um, preaching or giving a sermon today because uh, I've come to really, really love the river. Um, and uh, yeah, I just find myself um, going deeper in my appreciation and gratitude for this church. Um, for the last few weeks, we've been praying and fasting in our Lenten sermon series, and we've kind of been building up to Jesus's crucifixion. Um, over the last few Sundays, we've gone over our John 13 through 15, uh, where Jesus has been spending his last meal with his disciples um, and began with the foot washing and then continued um, into showing them how to live in his way in light. Um, in this chapter, John 16, um, Jesus knows he's about to die. And we find him trying to explain this um, and prepare his friends for this certainty. He tells them that they're going to experience persecution and pain, but that the Holy Spirit will help them. The disciples are confused until Jesus uses a metaphor for a woman giving birth to a child um, to, in order to kind of illustrate to them that their suffering and confusion will be met by the spirit of truth that will bring them into greater intimacy with God. In fact, Jesus' final um, parting words in this chapter, right before he prays for them, um, is a heartening battle cry. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Um, today, we're going to start with kind of exploring some of the parts of chapter 16, and then I'd like to move into sharing a testimony from my life, uh, where this last sentence, this last encouragement from Jesus particularly um, came into view, it came into focus and became real to me. Um, and this happened during my can uh, third cancer diagnosis. Um, it's a story where God intervened to save my life, and the Holy Spirit led me and others into all truths 
uh, which Jesus says in John 16, 13, that the Holy Spirit will do. As it sometimes happens for all of us, parts of our lives sometimes intersect with scripture and parts of my life uh, kind of intersect, intersect with this chapter 16. Uh, there was a painful period of confusion, pain, and sadness uh, that kind of gave way to softening, to joy, and to new life. Um, we'll kind of end today by asking God's Spirit to show us an area of our lives where God wants us um, to have more courage and to trust that Jesus has overcome. So I'll just pray real quick. God, I ask that you would be with us now. Please guide my words and please be with those who are watching and listening. Um, ask that you be guiding us into all truth and that your presence would be speaking to us and ministering to us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Jesus tries to pack a lot into this chapter. Um, he sort of repeats things that he said to them in previous chapters. There's a lot going on. And if you've ever read um, this text, you'll probably have found it confusing. It's not just you. It is confusing and it's complicated, both in English and in the original Greek. Uh, Jesus is telling his friends new things. And at the same time that he's telling them the, telling them these things, he's also telling them why he's telling them. Um, and then he's also kind of adding extra things. He's saying to them, hey, I didn't tell you things at the very beginning, but now I'm telling you these stuff, this stuff. Um, also, there's more things that I wish I could tell you, but I can't. Um, Jesus is trying to communicate a lot of information about the future, about the past, all at the same time. Uh, text is ordered in a way that um, seems to suggest that it's supposed to be confusing to read um, and supposed to maybe invite us to take a step back and see what else is going on. In John 16, 1 to 2 and 33, uh, he says, Jesus says, I've told you these things. And he says, I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to the Father in uh, verses 4 to 5. And then in verse 12, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. It's a lot of information being communicated by Jesus. Um, then later on in the chapter, um, Jesus predicts some of the different types of troubles that his disciples and us readers will face. Uh, while the disciples don't verbally cite their own trouble as causing them confusion, Jesus recognizes and sees their low emotional states as preventing them from understanding fully. He says to them, none of you have asked me, where are you going? Rather, you were filled with grief in verse 6. And in verse 12, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you could bear. In verse 2, he tells them that the disciples are going to be put out of the synagogue and they're going to be killed. Um, in verses 16 to 18, um, he has this exchange with them about being gone for a little while, and they're completely confused. What does he mean by a little while? They keep asking themselves. Um, Jesus says that they're going to grieve and they're going to have great sorrow, um, and that they'll be scattered each to their own home. Um, he tells them outright, you're going to have trouble. All this is happening and still the G, uh, disciples still don't really understand um, either that Jesus is going to die or why he's telling them these things. Um, all they know is that they're having this special meal and their teacher, their leader, suddenly out of the blue is telling them, hey, um, I'm going to go soon and you're going to have trouble. Don't worry. Um, you're definitely going to be murdered and harassed. But don't worry. Maybe we can sympathize a little bit with the disciples' confusion. Um, maybe we felt that emotion ourselves, uh, where something bad happens to us, and um, or maybe something bad happens to someone we love or someone close to us, and for a minute we're like left stunned, we're left floundering and confused. We don't understand this new piece of information. Uh, we don't know how to process it, and. Um, I think a little bit of that is kind of happening for the disciples here in this chapter. Um, in theological scholarship, these last few chapters of John 16, uh, sorry, John 13 through 16, uh, 17, 
are sometimes labeled as Jesus's farewell discourse. And there's an entire genre of ancient Near East literature where famous or polemic persons would summarize their message and then designate a successor, a successor um, in a speech before their death. One thing that sets Jesus's goodbye apart and sets him apart here, um, and something that should cause us to kind of sit up and pay attention a little bit, is that Jesus essentially says, says to his disciples, hey, uh, like continue sticking close to me because all of this, all of this that's happening is going to continue. And for my successor, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, which Jesus says is going to support his own authority and uh, lead the disciples into joy and truth in God. Clarity for the disciples finally clicks and pierces through the confusion by way of an analogy um, that Jesus shares of a woman giving birth to a child. In the middle of telling the disciples he's about to leave, uh, Jesus tells them that he's going to send them the spirit of truth who will testify to his own divine connection. Uh, this is the third and final time that Jesus has brought up sending the spirit of truth during his conversation with the disciples. And I'd like to pause real quick here for the next slide. Uh, boom, a uh, baby. <laughs> uh, baby I mentioned earlier. Um, my sister Natalie and her husband Tim just welcomed their firstborn son into the world, uh, Reuben Matthew. First baby to make me officially an uncle. He was born several weeks ago, um, as I mentioned, and he's still in kind of like read only mode and totally and utterly dependent upon his parents. There's something about a newborn, about a baby that suddenly brings a perspective shift, an immediate refocusing and a reordering of priorities. The presence of tender innocence allows us to reconnect with our own innocent nature and can stir within us um, and compel us to look at the new with new eyes, with new ears, with new strength and new purpose for life. When we look at a baby, we drop our guard. We are reminded that we are reliant upon God um, and others. We remember that life continues, life goes on. Um, the disciples are confused in a couple of ways here in chapter John 16. Um, yet somehow Jesus talking to them about a baby seems to switch something inside of them. A light bulb goes off. Um, and if we look at this picture of a baby, uh, it does kind of set a different tone. It kind of does something goes going on in our human brains where baby, <laughs> um, this kind of click happens. Um, the arrangement of the text makes a strong case for connecting the joyful arrival of the of a newborn with the joyful arrival of the Holy Spirit. Just as a mother receives a baby, so will the disciples and us readers receive from Jesus a spirit of a spirit of truth that will connect us to God. Let me rephrase that. Jesus tells his disciples that he is going to die and leave their side, but he will send them a helper will guarantee them a divine connection with himself and with God that brings joyful contentment. The text in John 16 is ordered in a way that we are invited to see Jesus's coming death, his own future absence, and the future trouble of both disciples and us as being similar to a pregnant woman in labor. We with our trouble are like a pregnant woman, woman in labor. And just as a newborn gives joy and clarity, so too will the Holy Spirit that Jesus has sent to us after his death. The Spirit, this Spirit, not only guides the disciples and us out of confusion into truth, but is also responsible for proving to us that Jesus is with the Father and has overcome the world. When I look at my nephew, one of the things that runs through my mind is a profound gratitude for life. I am thankful that I have lived to see the birth of my nephew. This is because while I'm only 35 years old, I have almost died and I've been told I was going to die 
many, many times, a couple times. There's a quote attributed to the writer Samuel Johnson. When a man knows he's about to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. In being told I had life-threatening cancer, I have felt the urgent immediacy of wanting to tell all those around me everything that's important to me before I die. I have felt that burning demand to entertain that once-in-a-lifetime dream vacation, check off a few boxes from that bucket list, since I unfortunately used up my Make-A-Wish when I was four. I felt that. And I imagine Jesus felt some of those strong emotions while eating with his friends one last time. It makes me pay that much more attention. Make me sit up a little bit, a little bit. When Jesus uses the little time he has left to tell his friends, hey, there's going to be a spirit of truth that comes. He points to this spirit. When I look at my nephew, I start thinking of the things that I would want him to know. Having faced my own death and troubles, what do I want Reuben to know? I want Reuben to know that Jesus has overcome the world and that the Holy Spirit can help him know that to be true. One story I plan to share with him when he's older is this testimony from my life where, in hindsight, parts of John 16 came to life. I would like to share that with this period of life, this testimony with you all. Um, it's a story where Jesus saved me from cancer by way of the Holy Spirit overcoming my hardened heart. Some important background information is that I had two separate intense cancer episodes um, at age two and 15. Um, there are stories of God's faithfulness to be shared at a different time, but this story starts my sophomore year of college, circa February 2008. I had just transferred to Chapman University, Orange County, and while enjoying life on my own, I took my sweet time in getting connected with the one Christian student club on campus. When I did, I found that they were bouncing off the wall with the newfound zealous passion for experiencing um, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, as particularly expressed in the charismatic tradition. Um, now, I grew up as a missionary kid to parents who came from vin the Vineyard Movement, which was a charismatic Protestant denomination. Um, and uh, I grew up in a ministry world overseas um, where Lots of Christians uh, spoke in tongues, got prophetic visions, prayed for miracles or words of knowledge. Maybe you get the idea. Um, I had also been around a fair share, my fair share of loud yelling, shouting, dancing, and worship. Um, slapped those cancers on it, and uh, uh, by the time I was 19, I was a little bit cynical and a little bit burnt out on God, a little bit burnt out on spiritual intense things. Um, I was a little tired from the chemotherapy as well, a little tired from the radiation and surgery and loss of friends. Um, but, uh, my student colleagues, my peers, um, were bright eyed and bushy tailed in the Holy Spirit, eager to experience God in a real tangible way. I couldn't fault them even if we were in different places. It was in that context, um, one guy, Josh, approached me and invited me to a prayer meeting. Um, at this prayer meeting, um, two guys shared with me two different words of encouragement. Uh, one of the words was very Christianese, while the other one was very much not. Um, again, I grew up around people doing this sort of thing on the regular. Um, but at this point, at age 19, I should say that I hadn't experienced this on my own, of my own kind of choices as an adult, if that makes sense. It's always kind of had happened in the context of like someone else was doing stuff or bringing me somewhere or I was a kid. Um, so when I was offered these two words, I was intrigued because they kind of unknowingly spoke to some insecurities I was dealing with. Um, and later I, I approached one of the guys, Trevor, and I asked, um, I said, I want to, I said, I told him I wanted to receive a word from the Holy Spirit myself. We talked and he shared a couple of simple things and then prayed for me. While closing my eyes, I immediately saw a picture of a unicorn running through a forest. There was a lion running after it and I saw it jump on the unicorn and take a bite of its underbelly. Uh, I asked Trevor for interpretation and he said, after praying a little bit, that 
He thought the same might be lion. The Satan might be the lion. And I might be the unicorn. And I was going to be attacked. I remember thinking... I remember thinking at the time, of course, that's the first picture I'm going to get when I listen to the Holy Spirit. I was bothered and a little turned off by the experience, and I filed it away. I didn't attend any more prayer meetings, not just because it was I was busy, but yeah. Um, when spring 2008 came around, so a couple months later, I ended up leaving, actually, Chapman, and I transferred to a college up in Oregon called Willamette University, where I planned to start my junior year of classes uh, later in August. So spring ended, July came around, and I had a regular oncology checkup over at Stanford. Um, the, my doctor came in looking grim and holding lung scans in her hands that showed a growth. I was told it was highly likely a relapse and that I was looking at 25% survival, survival odds. The news broke me. I had told God that if I got cancer a third time, I wasn't going to be treated. In the years after surviving my second hip cancer, I had prayed, I had talked and point blank told God that I couldn't handle another diagnosis, let alone another treatment. I had received maximum radiation as a toddler. By 16, I had received maximum dosage of multiple chemotherapies, and I had had major lung surgery, a hip surgery, a bone marrow transplant, liver surgery, and several dozen surgical procedures. I couldn't do it anymore, especially not anytime soon. Why would I get cancer in the middle of college? What is going on? I thought I was confused. I was stupefied. I was stunned. I didn't understand what was going on. And in the moment and in the following days, I felt condemned to die. Uh, I believe there might be cancer survivors who are watching this, or maybe someone here who's watching knows a cancer survivor. Or maybe you know someone who didn't survive. Um, I'm certain that there are experiences among those who are watching this video of folks. Um, people have experienced that maybe an event or a moment in their life where the bottom suddenly falls out underneath them. And uh, everything gets thrown up into the air. Where do we go in those moments? What do we do? Where do we turn? When we're tired and things are not clear or straightforward, when they're broken and muddled, what do we do? Normally I would have turned to God, but I felt like God had turned his back on me. So I thought I had no other choice but to turn my back on God as well. If God wanted me dead so much, I'll just die. Guess I'll just die. Except course. I'm still here. Um, God didn't want me to die. And while I was upset and emotionally reeling, the Holy Spirit started to do things. I had friends reach out to me with prayers of encouragement, saying exactly what I need to hear. And several of them cited the Holy Spirit as their source of inspiration. This was a new experience for me with my peers. One of my best friends was visiting different churches and he invited me to go with him. I'd never been to this church. And after the service, the pastor came up to me and shared with me that he saw me in the congregation and felt moved to share a verse from Psalm 118, verse 17. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Side note, I'm not, I'm trying to do that right now. I'm trying to live out that verse. Um, I had seen other people get words of knowledge and encouragement from God before, but Getting this on my own, independently, out in the wild, with strangers, was new to me. Uh, it was new. I was still angry and broken by my diagnosis. Felt like condemned, like a dead man walking. Um, so my brother and my dad suggested we go to a particular church known for healing prayer. While we were there, um, two separate women at two different times um, offered me a word of knowledge. From the Holy Spirit that were verbatim echoes from the two words that I received from the two guys at Chapman just a couple months before. That had happened about 10 days or so after my diagnosis, so we're talking like mid-July. Um, 
And when that happened, I had to stop and I had to acknowledge that something was going on here. God, I think, was trying to get my attention. I was admittedly impressed by the Holy Spirit trick. It seemed like a trick. Of continuing a conversation with me that had been started six months prior. I could explain one or two friends shockingly knowing message messages on Facebook, but I couldn't explain all of them, all the messages I was receiving, all of them happening at once, along with the pastors, that one verse from the pastor. I couldn't explain the quality of compassionate outpouring of encouragement and consolation I was receiving from family, friends, and strangers. Yes, just in general, I also felt the prayers that people began praying for me. I think sometimes we are too quick to discredit this ordinary move of love and compassion as a work of the Holy Spirit, but it is. And I saw and I felt God like pushing people towards me and like gathering people around me. I still wasn't okay. So I began prayerful, prayerfully wrestling with the Lord Jesus, questioning God's faithfulness and standing in my righteous indignation and, and entitled victimhood. This wrestling actually took place over a couple of hours. Um, while me and my friend were on a car ride, car trip. Um, and as I prayed, I felt my heart began to soften, begin to soften. I felt God invite me to surrender um, and to go through with the surgery treatment. I felt God say and invite me to trust him one more time. At the start of this car drive, this car trip, uh, I had an eye infection and I was wearing sunglasses because I couldn't look at any bright light. Three-fourths of the way through, I surrendered. And I told God, okay, I'll go through with the surgery. I don't know what happened, but by the time we got to our destination, a few hours later, my eye infection was gone. And I could see. I had clarity. Literally. What happened next was quick, quick, quick. A sternotomy was scheduled for late July, a couple weeks later, a week or two later. I had a successful surgery where they removed 18 tumors. The doctors were surprised because they had originally seen only one mass on the scans. The cancer they removed were very much non-life-threatening at that stage they were discovered. And the doctor said, I wouldn't need chemo or radiation. All that, that surgery was like one and done. Uh, what's wild and bewildering though, is that one of those 18 tumors, so not the one that they saw, but one that they didn't see, one of those tumors that they saw was a different type of cancer that was deadly and dangerous and would have 100% sure killed me if it had not been removed. While I lay in my bed recovering from my surgery, I noticed that the stitches and staples on my sternum, so they cut open my sternum like that and built up my lungs, uh, these staples and stitches looked like teeth marks, and the surgeon had accidentally removed a piece, a chunk of my flesh from my belly in a small oopsie malpractice. And while I lay in my bed recovering, I was reminded of that picture I got from the Holy Spirit of a unicorn being bit on the belly by a lion. Did the Holy Spirit give me a heads up the first time I went to listen? I don't know. But by the end of August, just four weeks later, I had healed from my lung surgery so quickly and so fast uh, that the doctors cleared me to go to school back up in Oregon. Well, up to Oregon, I had not gone back. It's the first time I'd gone there. And to start my junior year of classes. With that third cancer beaten and done, I felt a flush of new life, victory, and clarifying joy. Truly, Jesus had overcome the world, my world, and God's spirit was with me. Do you see how this verse from John 16.33 came into focus for me from this experience? It feels like God knew what was in my lungs and decided to start a conversation with me six months before my diagnosis. In the midst of my anger, my confusion, and my grief at being told I was going to die again, the Holy Spirit helped and advocated on my behalf through both unusual and usual, normal, boring means. Through relationships and through extraordinary, statistically improbable coincidences. 
And I want to make it clear, too, that I share the story not just because I survived cancer and some weird Holy Spirit stuff happened to me. Um, that is cool, yes. Uh, but I wasn't convinced that Jesus overcame the world because I survived cancer. I had already survived cancer several times by that point. That was like, whatever. <laughs> Not exactly, but I was upset. But my testimony here is about seeing Jesus overcome me, <laughs> my world of confusion, my feelings, my ignorance, my narrative, my idea about how God could work or not work. When I talked back and wrestled with the Holy Spirit, I received grace to soften, to soften my heart, to change my mind, to be changed, to allow myself to feel the convicting need to be brave and to trust God again. I was guided into many truths. God used my doctor's hypervigilance to discover the truth about my lungs, the truth that there was something unseen and deadly that needed to be dealt with. I was guided into the truth that the Holy Spirit knows the future and knows hidden things. I was guided into the truth that God loves me and that I can have peace in Jesus' words. What if I had held on to my anger? What if I had held on to my indignation? Which I still think I wasn't out of line feeling. What if I kept my back turned to God? I would have died. And it almost happened. I almost let my entitled, confusing sadness kill me. It's not that it was wrong for me to feel all those feelings, but I did have a choice to either accept or deny the Holy Spirit's courage. I had a choice to shut my eyes or to acknowledge that, yes, the Spirit of Truth has shown me something here, has shown me that Jesus has overcome. Jesus says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We all have a lot of trouble in our lives. You may think my story is great and all, but maybe you haven't had cancer <laughs> or you haven't had such an intense experience of something. Um, but I reckon you've been in a life situation where you've been confused. I bet you've been in a situation where you've left, you've been left wondering, what is true? What can I depend on? What is dependable? Sometimes we come across situations um, that threaten to overthrow us. Maybe we stand on the edge of something. Um, and we feel a lingering doubt, a doom or destruction hanging over us. Maybe it's just simply we're wondering if Jesus is real and trustworthy. I want to tell you today that whatever that is, yes, Jesus is real. Jesus has overcome your situation. And the Holy Spirit can help you with whatever it is that is sitting on your heart and mind right now. Let's take a couple of minutes to be quiet and listen to our hearts, to listen for God's spirit and share with the Lord the nature of our confusion and doubt. Then after a little bit, uh, we'll ask together, we'll ask God to give us courage and to trust Jesus once again today. God, you know our hearts, you know our troubles, you know where we have confusion and pain. In Jesus' name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask for courage to trust you. Open our eyes and help us see again how you have overcome the world. Amen. You are here 
moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here working in this place I worship you I worship you And you are way maker, miracle work, promise key, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise key, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart I worship you I worship you You are here Healing every heart I worship you I worship you And you are way make Miracle work Promise keep Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. We worship you and Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, never stop working Never stop, never stop You are way make a miracle work A promise keep light in the darkness My God, that is who you are Yes, you are We make miracle work Promise keep Light in the darkness My God, that is who you are springs of 
fall and bloom And when I find self my spirit fills Let thy own light to other shine Reflect all hell